All right, we're back again after a week <laughs> off. <got> on. <laughs> so, uh, we've been looking at the book of Exodus, and actually, right now, we're looking at the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. At uh, well, basically, right now, we're looking at chapters 25 through 30. We're not going through them uh, in order like we have been with the others because I kind of want to do things a little differently. God started off with the ark, with his presence. But I wanted to start off from where we start off, yeah. the outside of the of the uh, tabernacle, mm -hmm. actually outside of the, the whole enclosure. And we were talking about that last time. And I had just, uh, I hope this shows up okay. This is just a, a, an artist's kind of rendition of what yeah. we're talking about. There's a fence all around. It's a linen fence with... Uh, uh, poles vertical and horizontal with uh, sockets it sets in and then um, then there's the tabernacle inside that and you can see the the darker part of the wall that's the entrance we said there's only one way in just like there's only one way to God and then there's the the um, the uh, brazen altar the bronze altar where the first batch of smoke's coming from mm -hmm. and that's where they made the sacrifice. Of course, that's equivalent to the cross. And we talked about, again, you can't bypass that. You got to go through the cross to get to God. And then the next thing you'll see there between the altar and the tabernacle itself is a brazen laver, which we're going to talk about here next. We talked about the, uh, the brazen altar, which are just a bronze altar, basically. And that's, again, an artist's rendition of it. And you notice there's poles in that with that go through uh, hoops there. Uh, this tabernacle in the wilderness was meant to be portable, so mm -hmm. they could move. They weren't staying in one place. Later yeah. on, uh, the temple was built, and of course that was was stayed in one place because it was a solid building. But I was just thinking about that. You know, the the tabernacle really is more uh, representative of what our condition today because back then after the temple was built they had to go to a place to find God but now God goes with us wherever we go he goes with us so it's kind of like the tabernacle in the wilderness it it went with wherever they they went but again just going back to the fact it was meant to be uh, portable they take the, the, the linen fence down and and put all the poles and everything together and they would take it uh, most of those things did carry on carts but there were certain items including the altar the um, altar of incense we'll talk about mm -hmm. later and the showbread and especially the ark of the covenant they were not to be put on carts they were to be carried they all had these loops in them with uh, place for poles to go through and the priests were to carry those on their shoulders and we'll talk about that more as we get along. But uh, the next thing we see after we talked about the, uh, the brazen altar, the bronze altar that you see when you first walk into the gate, which you said was equivalent to Calvary with that sacrifice, which a lot of people don't really like. They don't like the blood. They don't like, uh, you know, having the, the sacrifice thing. And, uh, but that's God's plan. That that's not my plan. But as I said, the next thing you see there is, uh, uh, it's called a bra uh, the uh, brazen laver, or actually it's just, it's a bronze basin. Mm -hmm. And it was filled with water and it was for washing. The most interesting that this, uh, this is about the only item in the, in the whole tabernacle and, and that area that's not really described. Everything else, it gives the exact dimensions, how many square feet, how wide, how long, how tall, and how to make it, and you know, just everything about it. And the bronze labor, it doesn't say a whole lot about how they made it. Uh, does say what they was what it's made out of, uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But it doesn't give even a capacity. When uh, Solomon built his temple, and he built several basins like that and it tells the exact 
uh, quantity of water they would hold. But on this, we don't even we don't even know how how big it was uh, or how tall or anything. There's no no specifications on that. So I don't know if it just didn't get written down or if it was like that wasn't that important to God. I don't know. But everything else seemed to be really important yeah. that he'd give exactly everything according to uh, specifications. But anyway, this was a place of washing. After they went through the by the altar, there had to be yes. the sacrifice. There had to be the shedding of blood first. And, and then there's a washing. Some people want to go to that first. You know, well, I got to get cleaned up before I can come to God. Well, the truth is we really can't get cleaned up until, until we do come to God. Oh, well, we can change some habits and whatnot, but um, we'll never get clean enough to be acceptable to God. True? Yes, that's right. Isn't this also a, a picture of water baptism? Possibly, possibly, yeah. Possibly. Very possibly. Water baptism, which is, uh, it's, again, being. It's washing. Yeah, washing, uh, being identified with the death, burial, and resurrection yeah. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, the scripture talks about the washing of the water of the word. Mm -hmm. That is, the word uh, works in our life. It begins to wash us, yes. begins to cleanse us, begins to sanctify us so we could think of this as being sanctified too yeah. you know we come to christ as we are we he, we accept what he did on the cross and of course he accepts us but i've said many times even though he accepts us the way we are he doesn't leave us the way That's we right. are Thank you, he Jesus. begins to clean us but uh, got to keep it in the right order you know, you don't clean a fish until you catch it. <laughs> and we're not caught until we go through the cross, till we go through, as you might say, the brazen uh, altar, yes. the, the sacrifice. And so this speaks of a cleansing of our life. This uh, labor or basin speaks of a cleansing that takes place after we go through the cross. And... Um, I know that, you know, God sees us through the blood of Jesus once we've accepted the Lord as our Savior, but still, there's that cleansing, mm -hmm. that cleansing that has to take place. You know, we should desire to be changed. I don't know about you, but I wanted to change, yeah. you know, that's well, one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons definitely. I come to the Lord. I didn't, I didn't like the way I was before. Yeah. I didn't like the things that I did and the things that I thought, and I wanted to be changed. Yeah. And of course... You know he's still working on it. He's Haven't reached perfection yet, but this, he's honey. still he's still cleansing us. We're still having to That's go to right. the go to the basin and get washed. But yes. anyway, um, but anyway, there's an interesting verse uh, over in Exodus 38:8 where it talks about this is when they were actually making the the articles for the sanctuary. Uh, this not just God talking about it, but when they actually made it, it says they made the bronze basin as bronze stand from the mirrors of the women who mm -hmm. served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Yeah. So it was made out of mirrors. Well, now, of course, today we think of mirrors as glass, but back then they didn't have glass, at least not the kind that you could make mirrors of. I don't know, maybe don't know when they had first come out with glass, but anyway, the mirrors back then were made out of Shiny metal, shiny metal, bronze yeah. or brass. And, you know, when you shine up a, a piece of brass, it, it gets shiny enough you can see your reflection in it. And so uh, quite often, you know, we think of mirrors more as a, mm -hmm. uh, something of pride or vanity. You know, you hear about people that can't pass a mirror without taking a look <laughs> at themselves, you know, uh, thinking how good looking they are and whatnot. But... Uh, but also mirrors can be a, uh, I guess you'd say a source of abhorrence for some people because if you don't like your appearance, if you uh, just feel like you're not very good looking or if you've had uh, problems, you know, uh, scars or injury to your face or even people who have had real bad acne and they're scarred and whatnot, sometimes they don't even like to look in a mirror. They don't like the way they look. Uh, they might be repelled by what they see in a mirror. But God's word 
acts as a mirror to us in, in a couple of different ways. Sometimes not a very kind way because when we first start looking at the Word and we see what God says about us before we get saved, it's not a pretty picture. No, it isn't. You know, sometimes we we think we're pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm an all right guy. I haven't done many bad things. You know, and I do lots of good things and I'm generous and I do this and that. But when God looks at us, without Christ it's not a pretty picture no you know it's uh, the Bible says that we're uh, we're sinners we've fallen far we've short of what sin. God yeah. expects of us yeah and so sometimes we don't like what we see in the mirror uh, but it's also but it's also for the purpose of showing us how far we need to come how far short we fall and so uh, I think there's a connection there. There's a symbolism there that's made from the mirrors that we need to look in the Word and see see what we are, yeah. see um, see what God thinks of us. We need to reflect Jesus. Right. And that's the other thing. Once we are saved, sometimes we keep looking at ourselves as the same old person again. Oh, I'm just the same old person. No, once you get saved, once you've accepted Jesus as a... Lord and Savior, you're a child of God. You're more than an overcomer. That's right. We're changed. You're, you're, a, you're a more than a conqueror. You've changed. Mm -hmm. We're and, changed into his likeness. Right. And as we begin to look at the word, we should begin to realize that. Yes. You know, we're not going to change that much physically. You know, our face is not going to be changed because we uh, accepted the Lord, but... Our life is going to change, or at least it definitely should. <laughs> getting and a so, makeover. <laughs> right. That's, that's a good makeover. <laughs> yeah, you see these TV shows where they're doing makeovers yeah. all the time. Well, God does a makeover on you. Yes, and that's From why inside out. we need to look at the Word and not at our circumstances. Yeah. So often we tend to look just at our circumstances and and we look at our flaws and our faults, but we need to look at ourselves through the Word of God. Yes. That's the way God looks at us, through the blood of Jesus and yes. through His Word. That we are more than conquerors. We are overcomers. We are uh, children of God. We are uh, people that God loves. We are righteous. All of those things. We are righteous. Christ. That's right. We have the righteousness of God because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's right. And so we need to know all of those things. You know, we need to know what we are without Christ, because if we think we're all that without Christ, why well, we don't seek after Him. But when we realize what, how short we fall, what God expects, then that causes us to begin to seek God, and then we begin to see what, what He wants to do, what we look like afterwards. Okay. So, I was thinking as I was preparing this, thinking about how. You know, people talk sometimes about finding themselves. Uh -huh. The truth is, if we really find ourselves outside of God, uh, it's not a pretty sight. You know, if we really look at it, we realize how selfish, how greedy, how ignorant, how uh, short we come of what God expects. So self-discovery sometimes can be very frightening. But the truth is that God changes us. That's right. And God so changes we can us. Move on. And so um, we go on. Uh, well, let's read the first first James or James one twenty two through twenty five. This is out of the Message Bible. It oh, says, okay. "Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a listener when you're anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear." Those who hear or don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. Mm -hmm. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye and sticks with it, is no distracted, scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. <laughs> I like the way it says that. Yeah. So we don't want to forget either way you know outside of god we don't want to forget yeah. the fact that we are a sinner and we need help but once yes. we're in god let's not forget what god says about us the good thing he says about us the good things he says about us and 
that doesn't mean we get all full of pride or anything because all those things are just because of the, of the blood of Christ that uh, causes us to be cleansed, to be changed. So, all right, we've gotten inside the outer court. We've gone through the altar. We've gone through the, the, the uh, labor, the basin. And now we come to the tabernacle itself. Yes. <coughs> the tabernacle was, um, again, it was a temporary structure. It could be folded up and, and moved. Uh, it was uh, much like the, um, the wall outside. It was, it was made with uh, boards that were horizontal and vertical with the sockets they sat in and then uh, different claws and skins that were hung over it. it uh, uh, yeah. The framework, actually the framework of all the tabernacle was uh, made of wood covered with gold. Probably very likely symbolic of the fact, you know, the wood represents humanity. It's corruptible. It, you know, can rot away. Whereas gold is uh, symbolic of divinity. So in this human body, we're humans clothed in divinity, clothed in Jesus, just as Jesus was a human being, but was totally divine too. So the um, tabernacle, again, made of a framework of, word, of wood, uh -huh. uh, over that was uh, uh, a linen wall, very much like the uh, outer wall. The only thing was this was a colorful wall, just like the, the gate, the, the entryway into the outer court. It was made with blue, purple, and, uh, and yeah. scarlet thread. And so blue representing heaven, purple royalty, and, and uh, scarlet the blood. And then over that was uh, a layer of woven goat hair. That goat hair? What would you make out of goat hair? Well, do you know what cashmere is? It's cashmere is goat, goat hair. hair. That's so right. very possible it could have been a cashmere coating. I mean that's some some Bibles say seal skin. Well, well that's that's over the top of that. Oh. Uh, yeah, then there was layers of <laughs> ram skin and well some say porpoise, some say seal skins. Yeah. Uh, anyway, some kind of skin. So there's a linen walls, then there's a covering of the goat hair, cashmere or whatever. There are different kinds of uh, materials that could be made from goat's hair, but anyway, that covered it. And then there were several layers of skins, which did a couple of things. One, it would soundproof it with several layers of skin. Nothing that goes on within there could be heard, and nothing could be seen. That's and interesting. It would also be, uh, you know, make it waterproof. But uh -huh. uh, to me, that signifies the fact that. You really can't know what it's like uh, in the presence of God without going there. You know, people can tell you about it, but until you experience it, you know, what the Christian life is like. You know, a lot of people, you, uh, it's, it's, it seems like, you know, to them, the Christian life is boring. Well, you can't do this and you can't do that. But once you get in there and you see how glorious it is, and, and it's, it's the same way, you really can't, know what it's like to experience it. Yeah. Remember the expression pastor used to use all the time? He says it's better felt than telt. Than telt. In other words, it's better experienced than having yeah. people tell you about it. Yeah. You know, it's like any great thing. You know, somebody can, I don't know, say go to the Grand Canyon, come home all excited and tell you about, oh, this huge going. Oh, um, sounds like a big hole in the ground to me until you actually see it for yourself yeah. and it's like, whoa, wow. Oh, wow, yeah. Well, that's kind of the same way with knowing the Lord. You know, sometimes you try and describe it to people and oh, it sounds like a pretty boring life to me, you know, yeah. just going to church and whatnot. But I tell you, once you truly experience it, yeah. truly go into the presence of God through through Jesus, it's like, Wow. This is, it blows your mind. The of God is it's just, and, but again, you got to experience it. And that was, yeah. you couldn't experience this from the outside. They couldn't peek in. There's no windows to peek through and, you know, get a glimpse of it. You had to go in for yourself. And then there was two sets of curtains that uh, 
closed off different sections of the tabernacle. The first one that you went through, uh, you entered into a place called the holy place. And so this was a place where the ministry to God really began to take place. In the Old Testament, only the priests were allowed to go in there after they had gone through the altar, through the wash basin. They were priests that were, or they were men, priests were men that were chosen to mediate between God and man. Well, what does Peter tell us in the New Testament? 1 Peter 2, 4, through 5, 4 and 5, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, again talking about Jesus, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to yes. be a holy priesthood, holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. So we're a, we're a holy priesthood. The yes. church is, is, is a holy priesthood. Uh, we're, we're all considered priests. We all are able to go into the holy place. We don't have to have uh, a mediator now. Mm -hmm. and, and worship and serve God. And for uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says, For there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ. And so he's our mediator. We don't have to go through a, a, a human mediator anymore. We have Jesus as our mediator. Our mediator is just a, somebody that brings two people together, two groups or two people together. In this case, God and mankind. Yeah. Jesus is the one that brought us together and, uh, and made it, got us into agreement. So in the Old Testament, it was uh, the priests who presented the offerings, and they're the ones that went in you know, to the uh, the Holy of Holies, into the tabernacle. But today, because of what Jesus did, uh, we can go right in. And, you know, there's just too many scriptures to, to refer to all of them that, that talk about the believers as being in Christ, being in Christ, being a part of him. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you're the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. So again, because of that, we're able to enter right into that holy place and begin to really, truly minister to God. Until you get in there, you're really not ministering to God. But then once you enter into that first place, into that holy place, you're going to, you see three things. There's a couple of tables and a lampstand. Mm -hmm. And on your right... Uh, which is on the would be on the north side of the of the tabernacle. There's a table called the table of showbread, yeah. and like just about everything else, he gives very specific. God gives very specific dimensions: three feet long, foot and a half wide, and two and a quarter feet tall. Mm -hmm. And again, there was hoops made for it for carrying for poles to go through it. There was a gold rim all the way around it. And again, like so much of the tabernacle, it was made of gold, I mean, made of wood overlaid with gold. Uh, on this table, there was to be 12 loaves uh, of bread. Uh, I don't know, if actually loaves is a right term. They, uh, more like a flat bread, probably. I got a- Kind of like a tor fat tortilla. Yeah, there's a, an artist's rendition of that. Of course, this is an artist's concept, but it's taken from the description in the Bible. And you see two stacks of six uh, loaves, if you want to call them that, of bread. Uh -huh. uh, so 12 total, which uh, would, I'm sure, be signifying the 12 tribes of Israel, possibly a reference in the future to the 12 disciples. Uh, the fact of bread, symbol, first of all, the never-failing provision of God, mm -hmm. that he provides both physical and spiritual bread. And, of course, it talks about Christ. A couple of scriptures here in John chapter 38, verse, uh, starting in verse 32. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who has given you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I Verse, like that. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. 
And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Yes. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then in jumping down to verse 47, it says, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. Of course, manna was a provision of God too, but it says, yet they died. But here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. And of course, they're talking about spiritual death here. Amen. I mean, just because we get saved, eat of the bread of life, Jesus, that doesn't mean we don't die physically, but we don't die spiritually. Our spirits are forever with Jesus, forever with the Lord. Uh, and so it talks, of course, like I say, of, of Jesus, about he is, he, he is the bread of life. And then, um, okay, where is it? That's where we take our communion. Uh, right, yeah, from. that's another thing, our communion that yeah. we're talking about eating eating the bread or yeah. eating for, uh, uh -huh. of the body. And, of course, uh, we talk about the table, yes. the communion table. A table represents fellowship, uh -huh. uh, but uh, that's symbolic of this. Uh, that's probably why Paul tells us when we partake of the communion that we're to partake in, in the right manner, discerning the body of Christ. Okay. And so we're, uh, we're to partake of the, of the bread, of the body of, of Jesus Christ. And of course, some people had trouble with that when Jesus, in fact, part of this that I didn't read, some of that I skipped over, not because... It's not important, but I just, uh, because of time, but it, Jesus talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Yeah. And of course, a lot of people got upset of that and left him because of that. But, you know, he's not talking about cannibalism. He's talking about receiving of him, accepting that uh, broken body as, as being uh, broken for us and as that shed blood being shed for us. That's, that's the partaking he's talking about. Just like he talks about in several places about eating the word well if you can i guess if you want to you can eat your bible but it's not going to do much except give you a tummy ache but it's not talking about that it's talking about making it a part of you yes. what do you do when you eat something it becomes a part of you part it's changed into your muscles yeah. and nerves and all the different parts of your body well as we partake of jesus he becomes a part of us he's we, he becomes absorbed into us, and we just uh, become one with him in essence. And so they you know, have to be careful about taking everything literally. Otherwise, like say, we'd be uh, cooking our Bibles and eating them now. <laughs> it's just to eat the word. I don't think that'll work. No. Same thing with eating Christ. You know, his body only would feed so many people, but... Uh, uh, his spiritual body will feed the whole world. There's, there's plenty to go around for the whole world. So that's the, the first thing that we see in there is the, is the table of uh, the table of the show bread or the hollowed bread, as they said. And again, even in the, in the Old Testament, it was only the priests that were allowed to partake of that bread. Well, once again, we're priests. We're priests of God, so we can partake of that. We can eat that bread and um, become one with Christ. All right, I think we'll end there. Oh. Because uh, we got a couple more articles in the holy place and go one more the door. in the holy of holies. Well, we've already gone through the oh, door. Okay. We're inside. We're inside <laughs> already. We've we're gone through Christ. the door. Yeah. Okay. And we're in the holy place. And like I say, we've seen the table of showbread, and they've got a couple more things there, altar of incense and the golden lamps, the golden candle. Well, some place called candlestick. It wasn't really a candlestick because they didn't have candles back then, but it's called a lampstand, really. So, But I won't get into that. We'll, we'll get into that next time. Okay. But anyway, all right. Well, let's just pray. Thank you. Father, we thank you yes. that uh, even back in... in as early as this, Father, in the early life of the, the uh, nation of Israel, Lord, you're pointing towards Jesus yes. from the very beginning, even back when 
uh, after Adam and Eve sinned, you pointed toward Jesus when you said that, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of Satan, Father. So this is something you were prepared for all along. And all through the Old Testament, you give us signposts, Father, that point us, that all point toward Jesus. Unfortunately, too many people misinterpret those signposts, Father. But, Lord, I want to be able to discern those signposts and see uh, how they point to Jesus, Father. And, and I pray, Lord, that every one of us would come to that place of re realizing the importance of Jesus, that he is the central person, the central uh, theme of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, Lord, that he is the central theme there, Father, and it's only through him that we have eternal life. And so if there's anybody out there, Lord, that hasn't made that decision yet, that hasn't yes. gone through that narrow gate and, and gone through that uh, bronze altar and made that, accepted that sacrifice, Father, I pray today would be the day when they would just declare that, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. I declare you are the Lord of my life, and I ask you to come into my heart and make me a new person, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we'll continue on. Like I say, this is, these are mainly taken from uh, chapters 20 through, 25 through 30 in, yeah. in the book of Exodus. So if you want to read through there, it's, we're not, like I say, not doing it in order. I'm trying to go through as a person would go in and actually go into the tabernacle and the things that he would see in their purpose. So uh, if you want to read through those and kind of see for yourself, make sure we're not leading you astray. <laughs> and uh, anyway, and then we'll see you again next week. And we'll or tomorrow on. night, Joe, up at the church. Well, Wednesday. tonight. Oh, tonight. Tonight, because we broadcast this on Wednesday. So we do, oh. yeah, we do this live on Wednesday. <laughs> at the church too so you're certainly welcome to do that and uh, and always welcome and of course you're welcome on sunday mornings yeah. 10 o'clock we Come always have a wonderful down. service so look forward to seeing you have a good week god, god bless, bless.